We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is the Therapy Show Behind Closed Doors podcast with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Welcome back to the next episode of the Therapy Show Behind Closed Doors with myself, Jackie Jones, and the wonderful Mr. Bob Cook. And today we're going to be talking about defensive psychotherapy and is it a blight of the modern age? It's a really interesting topic, this one, Bob. It is, and I'm going to put you on gallery view instead of where... Oh, you've gone. I've got this new computer, as I said uh, before, on 90, and I'm, I now can't put you on gallery view. Ah, view up here. Right. There we are. Yay. There I am. (laughs) Uh, I see you. Okay. Right. I couldn't, I just had you and I couldn't see myself. Anyway, defense. Yes. Why I wanted to talk about this is something which I've sort of witnessed in the last four or five years, particularly in the United Kingdom, which really comes from the experience in the United States, particularly around psychotherapy. Now, psychotherapy in the United States uh, is even probably more popular than in the United Kingdom. And what's happened over the years here, um, especially with the big insurance companies, is that everything over there seems to be set up for litigation. So you find much, much more ethical cases going to litigation and uh, we have a different ball game really than the United Kingdom. However, what I've witnessed over the last four, five, six, seven years is more uh, litigation with regards to psychotherapists, for example, you know, clients actually taking out litigation and other bodies um, than ever before. And what I think may happen is the psychotherapists, instead of doing the um more how can i put this more um intuitive psychotherapy perhaps let's put it that way um they're now thinking twice about whether to do some of these processes so for example touching psychotherapy is a perfect one yes yeah let's take that as an example but i can think of others so i know many therapists who perhaps before we used to be more um relaxed when a client asks them for touch, for example, um, think twice. Yeah. Because um, of the increasing month, if you like, if that's a word, uh, of litigation in the United Kingdom. So they're more likely to say no, or at least uh, think before they actually say yes, which in some ways clinically is quite good. But in another way, if we're always going to be um, in the process of doing psychotherapy, um, defending against possible accusation, uh, ethics, complaints, and litigation, then it could be seen as a different type of psychotherapy in many ways. I think it's really sad if we're going down that road, Bob. What do you think? I, I just, I, I can see what you're saying, and I kind of agree that I think that's probably the way that we're heading, but I just think it's it's sad that, you know, at the back of our minds as therapists, we're going to be thinking, is this safe or is this not? I think clinically it's a good question anyway. Yeah. Um, so I'm not against that. It's um, There's been a huge integrate, um, increase in ethical complaints and litigation in the United Kingdom in the last four or five years anyway, uh, which I think has come from the permissions, if you want to put it that way, from the USA. Yeah. Um, and it's forced, I think, clients to, not clients, sorry, um, therapists to think twice about things like acting on intuition. Yeah. Having a sense of feeling. Or just, um, you know, going deeper in therapy. I would imagine there's going to be a lot of surface stuff going on rather than doing the deeper therapeutic work that maybe we're used to doing. Mm. Well, we know already in the UK that the NHS is favoured psychotherapy. If you want to call it psychotherapy, that's another podcast, the CBT, Cognitive yeah. Behavioural Therapy, where um, that is about thought change leading to behaviour change and not about 
any type of regressive psychotherapy or making connections between past and present. Now yeah. you can say that is led by the research. Quite there's a lot of research into CBT, and there isn't so much research pushed into a lot of the more regressive psychotherapies or humanistic psychotherapies, if you want to put it that way. I wonder also if, you know, um, perhaps this is my paranoia also, that uh, we're defending more by, you know, um, staying in the here and now. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's just a, just a thought, really, more than anything else. You don't have uh, therapies or intense therapies in the NHS which advocate regressive psychotherapy so much. It's mainly CBT. Yeah. Now, I know there's CAT, Cognitive Analytical uh, Therapy, which might look a bit more uh, about the past effects affecting the present, but the, generally more, it's CBT. Yeah, I I agree. Yeah, I think we are learning to be a lot more cautious in our approaches. But when I, when I I can remember when I first started seeing clients, which was probably about eight or nine years ago now, my main concern was more for my safety. You know, me putting myself at risk with with clients. It wasn't ever against you know, the client and me needing to protect myself from litigation. It was more the physical stuff in the therapy room that I was concerned about. Mm -hmm. But I think over recent years, that's definitely Because <clears throat> I know quite a few therapists that have been literally taken through the mill with allegations against them, unnecessarily. Yes, the last word is what I'm talking about, really. Unnecessarily. Yeah. And certainly in the USA, everything is set up for litig litigation. Yeah. It's a different system. Uh, you have the big insurance companies there. Um, I'm not saying we don't have insurance companies in this country, but it's a different setup over there. It's so, big business. Everything now is big business as far as litigation and allegations and compensation and all those sorts of things. Mm, mm. And more, I also know of many more colleagues that have had to face allegations if you like or ethical complaints and i'm not saying there shouldn't be accountability i don't want people no. to hear that no but it's me just neither. more that i wondered if that in therapists minds they would be thinking about oh i better be careful here about yeah. what i say or do or as i say physical touch is a perfect one isn't it yeah because um, yeah. that might lead me to problems yes yeah and, you know, with with just being overly cautious in all your behaviour within the therapy room, you know, the language that you're using and everything, whether it can be misconstrued. And I know we've spoke about it in past podcasts about, you know, the, the Father Christmas thing and, you know, us being the font of all knowledge and, you know, falling in love with your client or your client falling in love with you. It's all up for interpretation, isn't it? Yeah, I think that's always been there. I just think there's more intensity in this field more than perhaps I have been in previous decades. Yeah. And it's interesting that you have noticed that as well. So what, I mean, what does that lead us to do as psychotherapists? You know, I'm what? thinking avoiding certain topics or... Yeah. <laughs> thinking three times. Yeah. Times. Yeah. I picked it because I think that's a perfect one, which leads people to perhaps uh, defend themselves in terms of psychotherapeutic direction they might have gone. Yes. But they don't go that way because they're fearing, well, I might have an ethical complaint against me. Yeah. Um, I was thinking also about regressive psychotherapies, um, particularly where. Uh, in in-depth psychotherapy, you will be thinking developmentally, which is good. Yes, yeah. Um, uh, you may also think, well, if I do some regressive treatment here, um, at the back of your mind, you might be thinking more than ever before um, 
about what that looks like, what that means for the, you know, in terms of complaints and ethics and everything else like that. I mean, see, I think accompanying this, and I'd be interested with a podcast to um, listeners to think, um, please put it in the messages down below, that in the last decade, and I don't want this to be heard or construed in, in ways that don't mean it, but I think clients have had much more sense of entitlement than they've ever had. Does, does that make sense to you? In I'm not words, sure. Clients have had a lot more sense of entitlement. Yeah. Okay. In terms of demands. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. The therapist, uh, what the therapist should be doing, saying, looking out for all these sorts of things. You know, like, well, let's just make, let's think of um, the way, you know, ringing you or texting you, it happens nine at night. Yeah. Yeah. That, that sort of demands, which to some extent with the disturbed clients have, have often been there, but uh, it's become more the pressure on therapists to, to fit in, to comply, I think has become more intense in recent, this decade. Yeah, I, I kind of agree with you on that. But then for me, I think it's up to us as therapists to have boundaries in place that, you know, what's that, what we feel is acceptable outside of the therapy room i agree I, I i agree with you it's really important to have boundaries and the demands i think are more intense of what yeah. and what people expect of a therapist is perhaps a little bit more realistic than yes. they used to be. yes yeah and I'm sure I've offended some clients or upset some clients because I haven't immediately responded back to a message or an email that they've sent me outside of my normal working hours. Well, that's a perfect example. Yeah. Now, to the extent this has always happened, however, I think it's more prevalent, uh, people's high expectations, certainly clients, of what the therapist should be offering and not offering. Yes. And as I say, does that lead then to therapists acting in a certain way, which is more uh, less open or transparent? No. So do they sh close down more or not offer more options or yeah. be more rigid on boundaries or make sure their notes are copiously uh, printed out after every session? Yeah, I, I do think that we need, do you know what I mean, that we do do that, you know, clear consent forms on what's expected and what's not and, you know, the business side of things. But then I, I think society as a whole has changed. It's like now you can get 24-hour online support. That Does that then mean that our clients expect us to do the same thing? Well, there we are. I said, as I said, this is a discussion i love podcasters who's listening to um you know send you know just on the uh, <clears throat> below to say what they think about yeah this yeah i think working because... being self-employed and working in private practice to me is a whole different ball game to working for a company that has a call center or whatever that people can message or you know i particularly i i don't do telephone you know sessions i do online via zoom but it's really important for me to see the client i i don't choose to do it over the telephone i know some people do but i i don't oh i know some therapists that do text therapy yeah i don't do that either <laughs> i know some therapists that um i would say except for perhaps tiktok use most use maybe use all mediums um to I draw the line of text text therapy. I think that's yeah. Um, but you know, uh, I've been doing therapy for forty odd years, so perhaps I have the luxury of being able to look back at the decades. Um, it's just the therapists often don't seem so free in their sense of experiment, yeah. if you like, yeah. than they used to be. Yeah. As some people listening to this might say, oh, that's a good thing, because that means they're more accountable. 
Yeah, but I, I kind of agree with what you're angling towards, Bob. I think there's a fine line in being accountable and being rigid in our approach and not using our intuition or, you know, yeah. a, a kind of treating every client the same and not, you know, looking at their individuality for fear of going off off grid or somehow. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, I've run a, I've run a psychotherapy training institute for since 1993. I've trained many, many psychotherapists over the years. I know one thing, though, in 2024, there's more shoulds or should nots than ever before. Mm. In terms of training modules around this, must include that, must do this, must, um, if there isn't this, if there's not this, if the therapist doesn't know about neurodiversity or ethnicity or uh, whatever way you want to look about it, then there's more complaints. Yeah, which I agree, we, we should know a lot of that stuff, but that's taken away from the work that we actually do do a lot of the time if we're getting caught up in the specifics of. Yeah, I think I'm talking about expectations. Yeah. That's, that's why I started off about entitlement. Yes. It's not, it's not that we don't need to know a lot of the things, intersectionality, <laughs> Uh, neurodiversity I, I could go on it's not that we don't need to know that it's not that that doesn't make us more quality counselors or therapists it's not that it's it's the words you used before it's level of intensity yeah if we don't know those things the people then get you know more uh that's why i use the word entitlement that or shoulds or shouldn't do the therapist has to have to fit into these expectations. And it's a discussion. Some people listen to this, but so well, that's how it should be in 2024. Yeah. But does it lead to therapists feeling more constrained, uh, not able to do more experimentation in the clinical process, um, being more uh, thinking about what they can't do and what they can do? You know, does it lead a therapy? That's what I mean by defensive psychotherapy. Yes, defending yeah, yeah. Against experimenting. It's defending against um, the use of intuition. It's defending against freedom and creativity because they feel constraints about shoulds or should not. Yeah. Otherwise, they might get sued. Yes, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it, 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 there is a fine line in having the freedom to do you know that and protecting ourselves it's 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 a very fine line that i think we're treading sometimes as well as working with people that have got mental health issues you, do you know what i mean i think it's always been an area of difficulty to a certain extent so what do we do bob well i, I just want to repeat something i do think Therapists need to, know, need to know all these areas we're talking about. Yeah. They do need to know about intersectionality. They do need to know about neurodiversity. And they do need to um, be uh, au fait how that, and how that affects therapeutic discourse. So I want to be clear about that. Yeah. What I am saying is I think there's more shoulds and should nots which are put on to therapists nowadays, and they may feel more constrained around experimentation, creativity, intuition than ever before. And in your view, does that mean that the client suffers? Well, have you got a therapist that always in their back of their mind thinks it's a policeman watching them, or in the back of their mind they think that uh, I better have this checklist of I've done this, right or I've done that right or I've fitted into this box or I haven't fit into bo this, to this box and if I haven't then I'm, open, I'm leaving myself vulnerable if that's always, that narrative is always more vocal than ever before then you might close down in experimentation yeah. you might close down in sense of creativity you may not listen to your own intuition because this this narrative of uh, I've just talked about playing around in the th the person's head. Now again, people listening to this podcast might say, 
Well, you know, in 2024, therapists need to be more accountable. They need to be, um, you know, have all these things in, the, in their head and everything that goes with that. So it's a discussion. I tend to think, though, um, especially in the States, and I think following into the UK, people thinking a lot more about the shoulds and should nots. And it, and it might be constraining. Yeah. Yeah. As you were talking then, I was thinking about whether I've changed the way that I do things. And I, I, I'm not sure whether I have, but I was thinking about explaining the process of, you know, why I do what I do in a therapy session. But then that can lead. Yeah, I do do educational psychotherapy. I like to explain, you know, things about the, you know, the core topics and, and whatever. But then does that get the client back in the head and the logical thinking and move away from the feelings? And is that a good thing? You know, if we're, we're both in our heads and thinking very logically and keeping it on a surface level and not actually getting to a deeper place, mm -hmm. is that therapeutic? Am I doing my clients well, an injustice by not going there? Uh, that's a really good reflection. I know, well, I think immediately about that. But if you are always in your heads thinking about, uh, well, have I ticked this box? Have I yeah. ticked this box? Have I done this? Have I done that? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. How can you ever be really in relationship with the person in front of you? Yeah. And a lot of it is spontaneous and intuitive and relational in the moment. That's that's what it is to me. Mm. And because of all the shoulds and should nots, and again, I'm not saying that. That, that's not a positive thing today from where it was in the wild west when i started to train in 1984 we know we moved a million miles for the better yeah so people to think that but does this sort of list of what therapy should or should not do lead to over caution by the therapist which may then lead to exactly what you've just talked about not being in the relationship with the client in a whole way because they're always somewhere else. Yeah. And then does that lead to less effective therapy? Yeah. It's an interesting reflection, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. And I'm thinking, you know, I'm thinking about getting to a point where, you know, clients and therapists sign a disclaimer or do you know what I mean? We have to go through, like you said, a checklist of what's acceptable and what's not. And, yeah i'm sure in the states you have a whole contract signed by both parties before you even um utter a, a sentence yeah and even that i do have a contract and it has the business side of things as well as you know the other side of things but i'm conscious even now that that can be overwhelming for some people to have to go <laughs> through that process of form filling you know, and if it needs to be more in depth or I'm covering my back or whatever it is, you, you know, two sessions are going to be taken up just filling out bloody forms. And if you if your client is um, put no, let's put it another way. If the therapy is being paid by the insurance companies. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Insurance companies. And especially again in the United States. Or may want the contract to be four or five pages long. Yeah. To cover on both sides, to cover yeah, themselves. Yeah. And I, that's, I do. That's understand. what I mean by defensive psychotherapy. Yeah, yeah. And I do understand a lot of it, but it's just, I just think it's very sad if we end up going down that road. Well, we certainly have in the USA. Yeah. And like you say, we usually follow suit. We do. Now, a lot of our, now a lot of our well, it's not quite the same in some ways because um, many of our clients and I, I don't know the research on this but it's a high number of percentages the therapy isn't paid by the uh, yeah. big insurance companies yeah. they usually pay privately so we have a different story I think um, it's the big insurance companies which are 
want their client to be protected and yeah. XXX that goes with that, um, that will dictate more contractual therapy, I think. Um, most private, most uh, most therapy counseling is still paid privately, I would say, definitely. Yeah. Uh, doesn't mean Bupa and other um, insurance companies don't um, come in and say XXX, but I, I can't, I haven't got percentages hand, but I'll bet 90% at least. And then if anybody's listening to this podcast's clinical load will be privately paid. Yeah. Now, if they work in organizations, you might have a bit of a different story. Yes. Yeah. I agree. Story altogether. Yeah. Um, and it'd be interesting to look at um, people's stipulations and different organization stipulations around contracts um, because they're paying the bill um, than private people. Yeah. Because in private practice, I, I, I am I mean, insured. I have, you know, personal liability insurance or you know if somebody trips up when they walk in through the door and all that sort of stuff but I'm not sure and I don't know whether I should know this whether by law we need to have a contract no because there were because there's no um it hasn't you know, there's not a bill that's passed through like you know it was with um osteopaths yeah right so Osteopaths are regulated. Psychotherapists and counselors are not regulated. They've set up their own internal regulating bodies yes. since the nineteen nineties with the BACP, the UKCP, the National Psychological Society, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So those regulating bodies come out with certain um, good practice yes. framework. Yeah. Um, as the UKCP does, the BACP, the National Psychological Society, XXX. Um, but they don't have statements like there has to be this in contacts and XXX again. It's more like well, this follows good practice. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And that's what was, you know, in my training or whatever, we did do a whole, you know, weekend on contracts and, and you know. Good practice. Absolutely, yeah. Well, if the big, huge insurance companies are paying for 50 sessions of sessions or 20 sessions of sessions like they are in the USA, yeah. not, some, not in this country, then they may expect certain things which are far more um, rigorous. Yeah. Say, in this country. Yeah. And it, it, it's a really fine line, Bob, but like you're saying, you know, we're not saying that you shouldn't be mindful of this stuff and know, you know, and that's where, for me, continuous professional development comes in, you know, is that we're we're constantly learning and evolving as therapists, not, you know, qualifying 15 years ago and then that's it, not updating yourself on things. But there's a fine line in protecting yourself and doing good therapy. <laughs> I think... I think that's very true. And if you're always having in your head, I can't do this because of this, this is and this, and I must X, 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 and X, I think it's more challenging perhaps to, as I say, you know, have experimentation in psychotherapy, yeah. perhaps to follow intuition or be creative or um, because you always got this list in your head yeah. to watch out for. I think for me, one of the biggest things that I am a stickler for, and I'm sure I've really annoyed quite a few clients in my career, is about ethics and confidentiality. You know, when they kind of want you to bend the rules slightly on what you can do and what you can't do, I'm really rigid on certain things. You know, like who I see, if I see a couple, then I wouldn't then go on and see them individually. Or if I see an individual, I wouldn't then see them as part of a couple because ethically it's just not, it just doesn't feel right for me. Well, of course, I don't know which regulating body you're part of, but the UK, PACP and all the major regulating bodies will have ethic guidelines. And, and what you're also saying is you yourself have a sense of 
what's ethicality yeah yeah for yourself which i think is good as well i think i think i think we all need to have a level of um thinking about what is good practice yes uh, and i think also we do need to know the ethical frameworks or sets and standards of our different regulating bodies so i, I do think all that i don't say we so that's good what you have said all those sorts what i'm saying though is is this becoming a bit more rigid a bit more intense a bit more black and white yeah and does that lead us to a certain way of doing therapy which may mean that that psychotherapy road isn't so effective i think so i think it does make us more defensive in our therapy absolutely I certainly think there's a good discussion to be had about yeah. that yeah and i'm sure i'm sure there's a book books written or articles written about it but there should uh, be I, I thought about it and i've seen a trend that way and i know a friend of mine who recently was um you know uh, taken complaints out for certain reasons which i perhaps wouldn't have gone that it perhaps it wouldn't have gone that way 15 years ago yeah so i'm not saying we haven't got to have good standards i'm not saying that we don't have good practice yeah i'm saying when perhaps that i'm saying perhaps that's become more rigid and intense and more entitlements and more expectations and more um we think those things nowadays and that perhaps doesn't lead us to um you know all the things i've talked about in this podcast really yeah and that's a shame it is a shame yes yeah, so it is a very fine line and i do believe other cultures like i said and i picked out the usa because i know it a bit more is set up for litigation by the big insurance companies and i'm sure therapists think twice all these big long contracts people have to sign before they ever start seeing their therapist yeah yeah which is is really hard you know i i've had a couple of clients lately that you know we, we've normally i email contract out and they fill it out online and then they send it back to me but i i've seen you know a few clients recently that have found that difficult to do you know, so we we fill it out together in the session, and right. things like right. that. Do you know what I mean? So it, it all this form filling can be really off putting and stop people from accessing the support and the help that they need purely and simply because they've got to fill out all these bloody forms. I couldn't agree with you more. Absolutely. But I get that we need to have protection in place. We can't just go, like you said, back to the Wild West and we just, you know, run amok and do what we want. There has to be, but it's a very fine line, Bob. It's been a a, a really thought-provoking topic, this one. And yeah, like you said, you know, if people want to comment, then we would love to hear what people have to say about it. Yeah, we could even have a second podcast on it, but I'd love to hear what people think and feel. Yeah, yeah. Answering anybody's comments or questions about it. Oh, As with great. any of the podcasts that we do, yeah. No, it's quite a few, and I answer quite a few. Um, so I, I like that when people leave comments, which I can perhaps reply to. and um, That's good, because people are including themselves. Yes, yeah, yeah. And it lets us know that we're doing what people want more of. <laughs> so what we're going to be looking at in the next episode, Bob, is diagnosis. Is it useful in counselling and psychotherapy, which I think leads on quite well from this. Yeah, and everybody listening this to this podcast, I am sure has got plenty to say about this. It's an interesting one. Yeah. Okie doke. Until next time, Bob. See you then. Bye-bye. Bye. You've been listening to The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.